Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the services of the church. Delighted to see each of you here this morning. People are still coming in. I tell you what, let's take about 15 seconds or so. And if you see a visitor, get up and greet them, make them feel welcome. Let's get up and greet some visitors. And if you see any, and encourage them to come back and be with us again. All right, everybody, thank you very much. Visitors, we hope you know that you are our special guest and that we are delighted with your presence. We hope that you'll come back and be with us anytime you can. We also want to welcome those listening to the program uh, here at church on WITB Radio. Had a card from Sister Wilma Darnold, said she really enjoyed listening to the program, listens to it every day. So we welcome her and all of the others who listen to the program. Thank you for tuning in. Also, for the, the, uh, the service being broadcast on the World Wide Web, everybody out there in land, regardless where you are, we're delighted that you're, that you're with us today. I want to remind everybody that we would really like to have a record of everyone's attendance. Visitors, there's a visitor's card in the pew back in front of you. If you will fill it out and put it in the collection plate or put it at the end of the pew, we'd be delighted with that. Uh, also, members, we need a record of your attendance as well. So if you would fill one out, we'd be very pleased. I'd like to share a scripture with you that's a very familiar one. We use it here from time to time because it is so appropriate. It's from Psalm 100. Share that with you. Make a joyful shout to the Lord, all you lands. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come before his presence with singing. Know that the Lord, he is God. It is he who has made us and not we ourselves. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. Enter into his gates with thanksgiving and into his courts with praise. Be thankful to him and bless his name. For the Lord is good. His mercy is everlasting and his truth endures to all generations. Please join us as we begin our worship service. Good morning. Shall we stand and sing page 528? I know that my Redeemer lives. We'll sing the first, second, and last verse. I know that my Redeemer lives and ever prays for me. I know eternal life he gives from sin and sorrow free. I know, I know that my Redeemer lives. I know, I know eternal life he gives. I know. I know that my Redeemer lives. He wills that I should wholly be in word and thought, in deed. Then I this holy face may see when from this earth life free. I know, I know that my Redeemer lives. I know, I know eternal life he gives. made with hands most wonderful to see. I seated. 
Our next song will be page 509. Page 509. I will sing the wondrous story. We'll sing the first and third verse. I will sing the wondrous story of the Christ who died for me. How he left his home in glory for the cross of Calvary. Yes, I'll sing the wondrous story of the Christ who died for me. Sing it with the saints in glory gathered by the crystal sea. He will keep me till the river rolls its waters at my feet. Then he'll bear me safely over where the loved ones I shall meet. Yes, I'll sing. <coughs> Pardon me. Our next song will be page seven seven. <coughs> Excuse me. Glorify thy name. We'll sing all three verses. Father, we love you, we worship and adore. Our song before prayer will be page 797, page 797, Lord we come before thee now. Lord we come before thee now, at thy feet we humbly bow, oh do not our suit disdain, shall we seek the Lord in vain, shall we seek the 
our Father who art in heaven. Thank you, Father. Thank you for each one that's in attendance this morning. Thank you for each one and their love for you and their love for the work that's here to be done. May we indeed as a body glorify you on earth as you are in heaven. We are mindful, Father, of those who could not be with us today, those who want to be here, but their health will prevent from being so. We ask that they can be comforted, they can be encouraged, and they can be strengthened, Father, in the days to come. We pray, Father, that we as a congregation can minister to others, not only in, within the church, but outside the church. Help us, Father, to be a shining light to this community. And again, help us that we can bring glory to you. Be with our speaker of the hour. Bless him in what he's prepared. Thank you for him and his family. Be for, with uh, the elders of this congregation, with uh, the teachers of this congregation, Father, uh, deacons and all those who serve. Thank you for loving us, Jesus. In your name we pray. Amen. Our song before the Lord's Supper will be page 364. Come share the Lord. We'll sing all verses. We gather here in Jesus' name. His love is burning in our hearts like living flame. For through the loving Son, the Father makes us one. Come take the bread, come drink the wine, come share the Lord. No one is a stranger here. the bread the Lord who pours the cup is risen from the dead the one we love the most is now our gracious host come take the bread come drink the wine come share the Lord we are now a family glory of our Lord and coming King. Now we anticipate the feast for which we wait. Come take the bread, come drink the wine, come share the This weekend is a time where everyone is preparing for the 4th of July. People are already traveling on vacations, preparing hamburgers, hot dogs for their friends and families to watch fireworks to mark what happened back in 1776, marking America's independence. This morning we have a celebration, just as we do each and every Sunday morning on this first day of the week to mark our dependence that Christ has given us in our salvation. We as a family come together to celebrate Christ's death, burial, and resurrection. We should prepare for this celebration each and every week. 
just as most people around the world are preparing in days in advance for the summer holidays. We as a family need to come together as we have this morning and prepare our minds together to celebrate and remember Christ's death on the cross. Fourth of July will come and it will go, just as every other holiday that we celebrate. What we do is forever as Christians. It's forever. It's eternity. And it's we as what Christians should do each and every week. So let us take a moment to prepare our minds as we prepare to partake of this Lord's Supper. Let's take a moment of silence as we prepare just for a moment, folks. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, we're so thankful for this beautiful Lord's Day. This day, Father, which we can come together to celebrate, to love, and to remember Christ's death upon that cross. Father, be with us as we partake of this bread. Help us, each and every one of us, Father, to partake in a manner that is pleasing unto thee. Father, we ask this in Jesus' name. Let's pray. Father, once again, we come before your throne giving you, <clears throat> giving you thanks. Father, we ask that you please be with us as we partake of this fruit of the vine. Father, this fruit of the vine it represents Christ's blood that was shed upon that cross. Father, please be with us as we partake and help us to do so in a manner pleasing unto thee, Father. In Christ's name we pray.
pray. Father, we're so thankful for this beautiful day, Father. We're so thankful, Father, that we live in this, this nation that we live in, the freedoms that we have, and Father, this church and how blessed that we are. Father, we ask that you please be with us, Father, at this time as we give back the portion that has been given to us, Father, to help strengthen not only this church, but worldwide. And Father, we just ask that you please be with our leaders as they use this money to help your kingdom grow. In his name we pray. Our song before the scripture reading will be page 587, page 587, shall we stand and remain standing for the reading of God's word following the song. If the skies above you are gray and you are feeling so blue, if your cares and burdens seem great all the whole day through. There's a silver light that shines in the heavenly land. Look by faith and see it, my friend. Trust in his promises grand. him in song, sing and be happy today. Often we are troubled and tried, sick with sorrow and pain. There are others living in sin, blessed with earthly gain. Take new courage, we cannot tell what tomorrow may bring. When the dark clouds vanish away, then your heart truly can sing. him in song, sing and be happy today. Oft we fail to see the rainbow up in heaven's fair sky, when it seems the fortunes of earth brown and pass us by. 
There are things we know that are worth more than silver and gold. If we hope and trust him each day, we shall have pleasures untold. Praise him in song, sing and be happy today. Now the reading of God's word. Following the sermon, the invitation song will be page 683. Page 683. The scripture reading this morning comes from Daniel chapter 2, verses 36 through 45. This is the dream. Now we will tell the interpretation of it before the king. You, O king, are a king of kings, for the God of heaven has given you a kingdom, <clears throat> power, strength, and glory. And wherever the children of men dwell, and the beasts of the field, and the birds of the heaven, he has given them into your hand, and has made you ruler over all of them. You are this head of gold. But after you shall arise another kingdom, inferior to yours, then another, a third kingdom of bronze, which shall rule over all the earth. And the fourth kingdom shall be as strong as iron, inasmuch as iron breaks in pieces and shatters everything. And like iron that crushes, that kingdom will break in pieces and crush all the others. Whereas you saw the feet and toes, partly of potter's clay and partly of iron, the kingdom shall be divided. Yet the strength of the iron shall be in it, just as you saw the iron mixed with the ceramic clay. And as the toes of the feet were partly of iron and partly of clay, so the kingdom shall be partly strong and partly fragile. As you saw iron mixed with ceramic clay, they will mingle with the seed of men, but they will not adhere to one another, just as iron does not mix with clay. And in the days of these kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom, which shall, be fr which shall never be destroyed, and the kingdom shall not be left to other people. It shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms, and it shall stand forever. And as much as you saw that the stone was cut out of the mountain without hands, and that it broke in pieces the iron, the bronze, the clay, the silver, and the gold, the great God has made known to the king what will come to pass after this. The dream is certain, and the interpretation is sure. You may be seated. Good morning. good morning. It is good to see everybody today. Glad that you're here. Glad we have an opportunity for us to study the Word of God together. This morning we're going to be looking at chapter 2's. We're going to start in Genesis chapter 2. We're going to move to Daniel chapter 2. And then we will finish in Ephesians chapter 2. So that's something to remember as we go through our memory glue going through all these things. Remember that tonight's going to be a touch on a different side for us. Instead of meeting at 6 o'clock, tonight we're going to meet at 5 o'clock. And we will have a devotional, a period of time where we get together and sing. And Corey Westerfield will give us a devotional, a very short sermon. And as soon as that's done, we are going to caravan over to help the brethren at Fair Dealing. They're having a singing, and some of our young men, and perhaps a little bit older men, will have an opportunity to sing over there. And it will be very nice to be able to fill that building up and to encourage our brethren. So if you have an opportunity, be sure to be here tonight at 5 and also to go over to Fair Dealing tonight at 6 as well. As was mentioned by Byron a few minutes ago, this is a special week for us in our country. Uh, a lot of people are gone at the beach. A lot of people are gone on vacation and things such as that. But on Tuesday, we gather together to celebrate our country uh, for these well over 250 years or almost 250 years. We have had a country which believes in freedom, a country which believes in the power of uh, the people, and a country which in many ways looks to God for guidance. And while each one of us, regardless of our political stance, can see bad things, not as good things about our country, I think we can all agree that God has blessed America and that we live in a country which 
gives us a good amount of freedom. And it gives us a good amount of opportunity to live. And so all of those who have served in our military, I want to especially thank you. All those who work in occupations that serve other people, I also want to thank you. And I'm thankful to be able to be in this world and in this country at this time. As we're going through the book of Daniel um, over these next few weeks, perhaps you remember last week, we studied through Daniel chapter 1. And we see where God was with his people, even at times where it did not feel like God was with them. Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, Daniel, who later would have his name, or had his name changed as well, we see where they were brought out of their country, their place where they're used to being, and it seemed like everything was done. But as they stood up for God, as they tried to live the way that God would have them to live, we saw last week that God was there for them. This week, I want us to look in Daniel chapter 2, and I want us to take a step back and see how God is there for us today as well. And so our question that we're going to look at for our lesson is, what has God done for you? Why is it important that you worship God? Well, he's the creator, he's the sustainer, and he's the judge. But he's also one who has blessed you and I considerably. It's amazing all the wonderful, great things that God has done for us. As you and I look at ourselves in relation to this world, in relation to culture, in relation to so many things, it may appear that we are nothing more than just a dot on the map. And, you know, you can look and see all the great things around, and yet you and I are just a dot. If you figure mathematical equations up, you realize pretty quickly when you imagine the 7.39 billion people upon this earth, how small we are. 7.39 billion. If you ever doubt that number, go to Walmart and stand in line, right? 7.39 billion people. Every two seconds, someone is born upon this earth. Every three seconds, someone passes away. Imagine what that's like. The passing of people and the arriving of people. And as you and I think about that, over these few seconds, there's people in India, people in Africa, people in Canada, people in America, people in South America, all these people coming to this world, leaving this world, and we realize we're included among it. Each one of us has a birthday, a time in which we've arrived. Many people have had children, times in which people have arrived. But many of us have grieved those who've gone on and who have passed, and each one of us realize there's a day coming when that snap, when that second, and that moment will represent us. And when we look at how big this world is, and we look at how many people there are, we suddenly realize, maybe I'm not as important as I think I am. We realize just how big this world is, and how far it is to get from one end to another, and the, the modes of travel which are necessary for us to go around. We realize just how big the universe is, when we think that the closest galaxy to us is almost a hundred million light years from here. That's the speed of light over a year multiplied times a hundred million. Imagine how far away that could be. When we think of the largest planet of our solar system, Jupiter, being almost 11 times the size of our planet, we realize just how small we are. And we're like David, who back in his writing, says, O Lord, what am I that you would care about me? Or as we say in our translations often, Lord, what is man that you are mindful of him? And so as we look at these things and we look at our politics and we look at the things the world has going on and we see how oftentimes we feel powerless and we feel short, we feel like we cannot stand the things in which we face, we oftentimes perhaps become discouraged. Because we realize that we're just a speck. But then we turn to the very beginning of the Bible. And as God tells us about creation, the point of creation, I think, the creation narrative, is how important you and I are. Why is it that you and I matter? Because you are the point of creation. You and I, mankind, are the reason why God created the world. 
on the first day, there was light, and God said it was good. And then God formed the seas and the land, and he said, it is good. Then God formed the vegetation, and as he created those things, he said, it is good. Then he formed the fish and the fowl, and he said, it is good. Then he created all the animals, and he said, it is good. And then he created man, and he said, this is very good. You and I are more than just a clump of cells. You and I are more than just another organism living upon this earth competing with all the other organisms. You and I are created in the image of God. And that's why we see the command to be fruitful and to multiply. That's when we are told, or why we are told, that we are to have dominion and power over all the earth. And so as you and I look across our world, and as you and I look at all the things which God has made, we rec recognize that this place was created for us. You see, God created the world to show his love for you. The whole reason why the Rocky Mountains have that beauty which they have, as those mountains go above the tree lines and as they inspire that all within us, is to remind us of God's power. As you and I read in Psalm 19.1, we see the heavens declare the glory of God and the earth shows his handiwork or his artistry. The reason why so many of us, as we've gone to the Gulf and gone to the Atlantic and some to the Pacific, the reason why the ocean inspires so much in us is because it reminds us of the vastness of God's love. The amazingness, if that's even a word, of how God has created a place for you and I to be. And as we look at the intricacies of flowers, as we see the amazing parts of wildlife, as you and I see the seasons as they come and go and as they change, each time we see these things, we're reminded that there is a God and that there is a God who cares for us and who loves us. Romans chapter 1 and verse 20 tells us that the invisible attributes of God are clearly seen by those things that are made. That is, you and I can know that there is a God by looking at this world. And you and I can know that there is a God who loves us because of the beauty and the wondrous nature of this creation. God placed us here for a reason. And that reason is that you and I may know that God exists and you and I may follow after God and live as he would have us to live. You see, Ecclesiastes chapter 8 and verse 15, Nicoloth, or the teacher, we know him as Solomon most likely. He says, God has placed us here in order to enjoy life, to eat, to drink, and to recognize the joys which God has given to us. This world is given to us so that we can recognize there is a loving God. We can recognize that he has taken care of us and that he will take care of us. That we can recognize that there is something greater than death, something greater than sin, something greater than the pain and the sorrows which we face in everyday life. And as something which is greater is Jesus, as something which is greater is God. And he loves you because you're important. Because you matter and because you're here. But also as we look at this world, it reminds us, as we look at the planets and as we see the stars which fade, as we see each day pass with the sunset, as we see the seasons change, as we see the way of nature in which things are consumed and things pass as days go by, it reminds us that our physical life here is not permanent. That just as this growing season will come to pass, that just as the things which we see around will soon be no more, so also you and I will reach an end. So you and I will reach the end of our life here upon this earth. Psalm 39 and verse 4, David writes, O Lord, help me to never forget that I'm a sojourner and it's transient in life. You see, we're nothing more than pilgrims. And so, looking at it from that perspective, it does not make sense for us to build up treasures upon this earth and put all of our trust in that. Knowing that very nature, it does not make sense for us to try to make permanent plans and try to make this world and this body 
our focus all the time. Because there's something greater. There's something more important. There's something that's much more eternal in life. In Solomon's prayer, 1 Chronicles 29 and verse 15, David there prays that we'll always remember that we are no more than sojourners and pilgrims in this life. And so as you and I look up in the heavens and we see the stars and the planets as they move, as we see the sun go, come up and go down each and every day, as you and I see the life cycles and the lifespans of the plants and the animals, we realize that we too are passing. But we see that God has placed us here at this time and in this place for a very important reason. Now, as we go from Genesis 2, let's run over to Daniel chapter 2. And a passage which was just read for us a few moments ago. And remember, if you will, the context as we're looking at this passage. We're looking at about 590, 586 B.C., somewhere in that range. Uh, D Daniel and his fellows were taken into captivity about 606 B.C. Remember, it goes backwards until we reach about the year zero, and then we start forwards again. And so here we are in this foreign country, in this foreign world. Daniel is a Jew along with his friends and they are in captivity, they are in slavery and they are serving the Babylonians. And the Babylonians are worshipping a different set of gods and have a different set of ideals which are there. And Nebuchadnezzar, as we read in Daniel chapter 2, has a dream. And in this dream he has some things which happen which are just fascinating when you think about he thinks of this great statue, head of gold, chest of silver, belly and legs or thighs of bronze, and then the iron, and then the iron and the clay and the feet, which was just read to us a few minutes ago. And so Nebuchadnezzar asked all the astrologers, all the magicians, all the people who are supposed to know these things, number one, what was the dream? And number two, what did the dream mean? Well, of course, they did not know because they were frauds. They, they couldn't figure that out. And so Nebuchadnezzar decides to put them all to death. But Daniel rises up, being a man of God, being able to interpret dreams, and he tells Nebuchadnezzar not only what the dream was, but also what the dream meant. And as you and I are very aware of this passage, probably in Bible classes many, many times that we've heard it, we know what it represents. The head of gold would represent Nebuchadnezzar. The head of gold represented the beautiful empire of which he was a part at that very time. An empire that was larger than just about any other at the time. An empire which was very regal. One of the seven wonders of the world in Babylon were the hanging gardens. Where in the middle of the desert, in the wilderness, you could see such lush tropics which were there. And Daniel says, that head represents you, O Nebuchadnezzar. But there is a kingdom which shall arise a little bit later. And so we go from Nebuchadnezzar, who is in the top there, down to Cyrus and Darius, the Persians and the Medes. And as you and I look at that inferior kingdom, at least in our minds, we think of the silver. And Daniel says, this kingdom shall arise. And it would arise in just a few generations. But Daniel continues in this dream to look even further ahead. And he says, in a few hundred of years, there will be bronze. There will be an innovative empire which will come. One of goats, as you look later in the book of Daniel. And that would represent Greece. Alexander the Great, after he had perhaps murdered his father, acting in revenge for the murder of his father had conquered not only Greece, but also much of that area. And he would come through and establish another empire. And a little bit later, come forth the Romans. Augustus Caesar, who would rule over the land. And as Daniel was able to interpret that dream and is able to show those things, what I want us to look at, at least for today's purpose, is God working in these world empires. Nebuchadnezzar thought he was great stuff. He thought that he had the greatest empire which would ever be, and that empire would reign forever. And as he looked at himself, he saw someone important, someone powerful. He saw someone who nobody could stand against. And what God tells him in this dream is, Nebuchadnezzar, you're coming to an end. And while you may die as the emperor, there's coming a day when I'm going to raise somebody else up to do my purpose. 
You and I today may feel great. You and I today may feel powerful. We may be of a younger age where our health is great and we feel like nothing could stand against us. But no matter how powerful you are, no matter how much you have it made, no matter how large your bank account or how great your reputation, know this, life is passing. Things are changing. You may be in a situation where instead of being like Nebuchadnezzar, you feel like you're oppressed and feel like there's nothing going right and feel like there's no way that you can win. But know this, time's passing and God is working. And so as we look at these great world empires which are coming one after the other after the other, Daniel, notice in Daniel 2 verse 44, brings in God. And he says, notice Nebuchadnezzar, while you go through these empires and while you care about this gold, remember in chapter 3, Lord willing, we'll study this next week, Nebuchadnezzar tried to change his dream. He tried to make a whole statue out of gold instead of just the head. He's trying to make a point. But notice when Daniel says, what you care about is changing, there's something in this world which will never change. Daniel 2, 44. In the days of these kings, King Caesar, king of Rome, the Lord God shall create a kingdom not made with hands. And it will shatter every other kingdom. And it shall grow and it shall fill the world. You see, God is working his time, his way, his method to control exactly what he wants to control. And while you and I oftentimes don't focus on that small stone, we focus on this great statue while you and I don't focus on that small part which really matters, which is the church, but instead we get caught up in politics, know this. God is working his plan. God is working his way. God is in charge. You see, each one of these kingdoms had a purpose. God was using each one of these kingdoms for a reason, wasn't he? We read in Paul's sermon, Acts 17, 26, and we spent some time with that lesson last week, how God sets the boundaries of every nation and God decides who rules and who doesn't rule and God is in the affairs of every nation. You see, God had the Babylonians take Israel into captivity so that they could be purified, unified, and cleansed of idolatry. Once they came back, idolatry was never a problem ever again. God used Babylon for that reason. God used Persia in order to bring his people back home. In order to put them in a way in which they could reestablish the nation and move back in to the Messianic Sea. God used Greece to take over the nation and to teach the entire world a certain language. So that the New Testament could be written in Greek and read the world over. And God brought forth Rome to bring peace to the world so that Paul and the other missionaries in that first century could travel from country to country freely. So that roads would be created, so that security would be there, so that Paul one day could appeal to Caesar in order to free himself of those who were attacking. Each empire was so self-important, but each empire was being used by God for a purpose. Today we look across our world and we see Iran, we see North Korea, we see Mexico, we see the U.S., we see Russia, and we see all these kingdoms which are fighting and wrestling against one another. But know this, God is using each one for his purpose. And while you and I may not understand, God is in control and God knows what he's doing as he works in the affairs of men. You see, God was working to bring forth his son into this world. And as you and I read through that parable or that passage in Daniel chapter 2, we see where in the fullness of time God brought forth his son born of a woman. And so as we go through Daniel 2, we see those kingdoms. And as we look in Luke chapter 2 verse 1, we see Jesus born in the days of Augustus Caesar. Well, we've seen in Genesis chapter 2 where this world shows us the beauty and the brevity of life. We've seen in Daniel chapter 2 where God has bringing the nations together for his purpose. Now turn in your Bibles over to Ephesians chapter 2. And as we look into Ephesians chapter 2, we see that God is working, not just through creation, not just through politics, but he's working spiritually within you and I to create in us what his eternal plan has been. 
All the way back in Genesis chapter 3 and verse 15, God made a promise to Eve that through her seed, all nations would be blessed and Satan would be destroyed. Eve misunderstood that when she had Seth. She said, now the Lord has begotten to be a man. While she was thinking, was Seth was the answer to that promise? Well, Seth was a part of the answer, but not the full answer. Because as you and I go through the Bible, we see this promise given to us from Genesis 3 to Daniel 12, where we see all nations shall be blessed by the seed of Abraham. Galatians makes a point. That's not plural. It's seed. It's not the nation of Israel which blesses the world, but it is one of Israel, which would be Jesus. We see that promise repeated in Genesis 15, in Genesis chapter 22, and if, in Exodus chapter 4. And as you and I go through almost every book of the Old Testament, we see that promise being revealed to every one of us. To where even in Acts chapter 8, the Ethiopian eunuch is reading out of Isaiah 53, and he sees the picture of Jesus. Well, what does Ephesians chapter 2 verse 1 tell us? You see, we once were dead, but now we are made alive in Christ Jesus. You see, we once walked in the, full, in the evil fullness of this world according to our wrath. We once were a part of the devil. We once were in that kingdom. But God, who is rich in his mercy, by grace we are saved, has raised us up and helped us to sit in those heavenly places. And as you and I see that, that putting down of sin, that raising and that placing up, we see a picture of baptism. We see a picture of our changing or our translation into the kingdom of God. Notice what verse 8 says. For you are saved by grace, not of yourselves, it's not of works, lest any man should boast. You and I have been brought or translated into this kingdom. And we see the grace of God which is operated. Now, go ahead and look there at that first seven verses. And we see a picture of where we are without Christ. Outside of Christ, you and I are lost. Outside of Christ, you and I are dead. Outside of Christ, you and I are servants for Satan. We're selfish and we're doing things only to please ourselves and our mortal desires, which are there. But when God raised us up, he has changed us. And when we are saved, we have a different view of life and a different purpose, which is there. And we see in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10, for we are his workmanship. Created in Christ Jesus for good works. What is the purpose of our salvation? Verse 10 tells us it is to serve and praise God. Verse 14 tells us it is to join us in a church. To put us in the body of Christ with other Christians so that we can raise one another up. Help one another as we can grow closer to God. And so as you and I look at that passage, we see God working through us. And it's a higher revelation than we see in just looking at creation. It's a higher revelation than it is just seeing a, that God works through the news and works through politics. It's the idea of you and I being saved by coming to Jesus. Well, the ultimate question we ask is, why am I here? Why is it when there's so many uh, births and so many deaths, when there's so many people on this earth, why did God create Mark Ray? Why did God create, and we could go through every name of the people who are in here, why did God create me? Why did God create you? He created you for a reason. Saul of Tarsus met Jesus on the road. He had repented of his sins. He had seen that what he was doing was absolutely wrong. He had spent three days in fasting to show his sorrow to God. But he was not yet saved. He needed to become a New Testament Christian. So God found a preacher and sent that preacher on his way. That preacher was named Ananias. And he said, Ananias, I need you to go preach to this man named Saul of Tarsus. And Ananias, like many of us sometimes, says, well, wait a second. God, are you sure you want me to do that? Don't you know who this fellow is? Notice what God said to him. Yes, you need to preach to him because he is a chosen vessel for me. You see, this man to whom you preach the gospel is going to be my representative to the Gentiles. 
He's going to be my representative to kings. And he's going to be my representative to the nation of Israel. God had a purpose for Saul of Tarsus. And that was to change him into Paul the Apostle. There's an interesting book. It's an autobiography of a fellow named Baxter Barrett Baxter. And probably a lot of folks here have heard of him. You probably have heard a lot of his sermons. Uh, several decades ago, he was a very prominent preacher. Well, he found out he had cancer. And he found out it was terminal. And so he decided in the last few months of his life, he was going to write a book trying to describe the relationship he had with God and trying to describe his life as how he saw it at that time. The name of the book is Every Life, a Plan of God. And what Baxter would assert in that book is that every one of us, regardless of who we are, God has a specific plan for what it is he wants you to do. Now, there's some people who disagree with that. And they disagree with it and say, well, God doesn't have a specific plan. He just wants us to be saved. I think God has a specific plan. Those who are mothers and fathers of children, God has a plan for you. Your job, in many ways, your responsibility is to try to raise your children up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. God, I think, in our marriages and in our families has placed us there to show love and grace, forgiveness, to show what it means for people to remain married even when it's difficult. God has chosen us, whether we're in the school system, whether we're in the business world, even if we work in a church. God has chosen us to show us, to show the world, it is, what it means to be a Christian in whatever state we are called in. You see, you're placed there for God's purpose. Going back to one of the providence passages we oftentimes will look at in the Old Testament. Esther chapter 4 and verse 14, you see a young lady named Esther. Esther was a young lady who in her culture and society may not have mattered very much. You know, oftentimes women were considered property. But God had providentially put her in a very special place. She had won a beauty contest. She was now the queen of the empire. She was now someone who had the ear of the king. She could talk to the king and the king would listen to her. But she was afraid to use her influence as leverage. <coughs> Excuse me, sermon's got me choked up. God came, or Mordecai, her uncle, came to her and said, you need to go to the king and save the, your people. And she said, I'm afraid. And he said, perhaps God has placed you here at this time for this reason. But if you don't do it, some, God will raise someone else up in your place. Well, as you and I have read the book of Esther, we see that she takes the courage. She takes that step forward to become God's person in God's place. And she saves her people and establishes the holiday of Purim. Now, you and I look at that and we see how amazing it is that she single-handedly could save her nation. But let's look at our life. What is it that God is doing in your life, in your time, in your world? There's some times where we look at the world and we say it's too big, it's too great. One person cannot make a difference. But when you and I read through our Bibles, we see that God takes that which is small and uses it to accomplish those things that are great. Who is it in your life God has placed that you may influence them to grow closer to God? What job is it that you're doing? What struggle is it that you're surviving that God can use you as an example of His grace and of His power and of His majesty? Yes, God works through the oceans and God works through the mountains and through the forests and through the wildlife to show us who God is. And yes, God works through the nations and God works through the political world and God works through the armies to arrange things the way that he wants it. But God's highest form of work is through his son and through those who have been saved through his son. You see, let's go ahead and close our lesson with this one phrase. God loves you. If you were the only person on this earth that was in sin, God would have sent his son so that you could be saved. When God looks at you, 
He doesn't see the beautiful veneer that you have on the outside because you're wearing church clothes. He doesn't see what everybody else sees because we try to put on our best. We try to not let people see who we really are. God sees me at the heart. He knows my desires. He knows our temptations. He knows our struggles. He knows our shortcomings. He knows where we don't measure up. But guess what? He loves you. And he wants you to be God's person at this time and at this moment. He wants you to take advantage of the gift of his son for you. He wants you to be obedient to the gospel and to be a part of the Lord's church. He wants you to be his representative, to be a Christian in your marriage, in your work, in your life. He has placed you where you are at this time, doing what it is that you do at this time for a purpose, to stand up for him. Going back to Daniel chapter 2, we see a young slave, one who didn't really matter in the eyes of the world, Daniel. But notice God had placed him there at that time for a purpose. To stand before the greatest man who had lived until that time and tell him God's plan. Tell him God's way. In the same way, we see that happening today. And yes, we're jars of clay. Yes, we're feeble, and yes, we're weak. But God works through us to accomplish his purpose. That's why it's so important that we be faithful to him. That's why we come to him, because he has first loved us. This morning, if you need to obey the gospel and become a Christian, this morning, if you need the prayers of the church, we invite you to come forward as we stand and as we sing. I want to mention a few people by name before we have a prayer. Give you some good news. Janine Crocker received good news from her post-op visit with her doctor this past week, and that is good, and we're delighted about that. Good to see you here. I want to also say at this point, happy to see Pat Jarrett here. Saw her come in. Okay, glad you were able to be here. At this time, I want to mention that Nancy Frick had emergency surgery this past week. She's in Jackson Purchase Medical Center in Mayfield, room 311. She's doing well, has had the breathing tube removed, I think, but will be there for a little while longer. Prayers, calls, and cards are 
appreciated, but no visits at this time. Also, I want you to know that Steve and Debbie Byerly are both under the weather. Debbie was released from the hospital a couple of days ago. Steve has been at home now for a week, over a week, suffering from diverticulitis and other issues. I need to remember Steve in her prayers. Sandra Johnson was in Baptist Health, but has been moved to Marshall County Hospital with serious health issues. The family asked for prayers, but no visits. Sister Eileen Christ has been in the hospital at Benton, and she has been released from the hospital and has gone home. She is not uh, well and uh, would appreciate some attention from the church family. These people, and there are many others who are suffering from many conditions that are serious in nature, troubling to them, and troubling to those who are caring for them. So let's go to our Heavenly Father together in prayer now and ask God's blessing upon all of these. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we come before you today again as your family, children of yours who were bought and paid for at a great price. We're grateful, Father, for the marvelous privilege of being your children, for receiving the benefit of your love through Jesus, for having been saved from our sins through obedience to his gospel. We thank you, Father, for each of these good blessings that we've received. We know, again, from your word that every good thing comes to us from you, and it comes because of your love for us, and we thank you for that. We thank you, Father, just now for these who have had good reports from their health condition. We thank you for those blessings because that's what they are. And, Father, we still have many who are suffering, who are sick, who need your help, need your guidance, need relief from you. We're grateful for doctors and nurses and all of the staff, but we know that true healing resides in your hands. And so, Father, it's to you we turn and ask your blessings, ask recovery, if you will, if it is your will, for each of these who suffer, regardless of the condition they face, physical, emotional, all of those things, Father, take a terrible toll on the lives of people. Bless each one who's suffering. You know intimately what they need, and we pray that you will be willing to provide it. We thank you for this opportunity to be together with family, for the love that exists for one another here in this place. Thank you for placing each of us here. Help us to understand that each of us has a purpose, and each of us has a role, and each of us has a job to do and things that you expect of us. Help us to be what you want us to be. Help us to rise to the occasion and to do those things that need to be done in your name. Bless us, Lord, as your children. Thank you again for every gift. Forgive us for our sins, we pray, for we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. I want to mention that Johnny Beard, a member at Hardin, has passed away. He's Robert Highland's cousin. Visitation will be at 11 o'clock p.m. Is it today, Robert? Tomorrow. tomorrow 11 o'clock. I'm sorry, 11 o'clock a.m. tomorrow at Collier's Funeral Home. The funeral will be at 1 p.m. then tomorrow. So let's remember that family. Also, I want to mention to you that our summer series uh, is, is getting ready. Mark Rowe will be our speaker this Wednesday night on July the 5th. Plan to attend, if you will, welcome that speaker and bring someone with you. Let's try to have a good, uh, good gathering here for him when he arrives. Also mentioned that we'll be hosting our first youth minister candidate on July the 15th and the 16th. Be here two days. They are bringing their two young children. They'll be with us the entire weekend. There'll be a cookout and a Devo on Saturday evening at, at the Pavilion at 6 p.m. See Scott or Laurie Phillips if you're able to help with that. 
be sure and ask all middle school and high school students to attend. We hope they can all be here as well as their parents. Uh, the candidates will introduce themselves to the congregation Sunday morning and uh, he will teach the middle school and high school classes Sunday morning as well. Youth families are really encouraged to have lunch with them and to participate in this. Be praying for the, the search as the elders continue to look for this, this minister to fill this position. And be sure and come and participate and interact with these candidates and meet them. Also mention that uh, our trip to the ARC encounter will be Saturday, August the 5th. The church will be paying for all children. Adults will be responsible for their own tickets. If you're planning to sign up and would like to go, please let Luke or Aaron know. We need to know how many people are going and how many will be planning to ride the bus so we can make reservations. A bus will be provided for all who need transportation. Sign up today, if you will. Sheets on the bulletin board in the foyer. The office will be closed Tuesday, July the 4th, just so you remember that. And I want to make this request of you. If you, as members of this church family, hear anything from the pulpit or from the classroom teachers that you have issues with or that you'd like to understand further, be sure and talk to either Mark or the classroom teacher. And then if, if you still have issues or concerns, come to see any one of the elders because we're really, really concerned that everything be done here according to, to God's will and we want everybody to be comfortable with that. I have three cards here I'd like to share with you. This first card is from Wilma Darnell. It's to the Benton Church of Christ. She says, thanks to you for all that you do. She says, I listen to the church every Sunday. Uh, and she loves Mark's teaching. And also, Wilma says she would like to have a bulletin mailed to her if we can. And she thanks us for having the broadcast. I have a card from, from Fred Miller. Actually, he said Gene didn't write what he wanted written, but it's from her and Fred. It's a nice card. I don't know what Fred wanted to write. I think I better go with this. It says, I will never forget your kindness. Thanks for all the prayers, cards, and calls. We love our church family very much, Fred and Jean Miller. This last notice is from Jerry Sales. It says he would like to meet with the uh, Benton Christian Scholarship Directors after church tonight in the library. Please remember to meet with Jerry Sales. And don't forget... Tonight's service will be begin at 5 o'clock. It will be a devotional. After that, we will all get together and go to Fair Dealing to participate in their song service there. Are there any other announcements that I have missed that anyone knows? Anything at all? Okay. Jerry, do you have another song? Okay. Do we have a closing prayer? Then let's be dismissed to our classrooms.